The Dark Archive and the Silent Book. Histories of Access in the Journal of Mistress Joan Martin. In a largely unread story by Virginia Woolf, a historian called Rosamond Meridew discovers the 15th century manuscript of a woman called Joan Martin. Martin's narrative in an entry labeled Midsummer makes the bold and mysterious claim that, quote, flesh and pens divide us. Wolfe's narrator's venture into the parchment leaves penned by Joan Martin meets its parallel in Joan's own narrative description of a vision she has after hearing a traveling salesman, a man who sings stories in order to sell books, recite the story of Sir Tristram and Lady Isolde. How is it that Wolfe, through her invented female diarist, could suggest that texts and specifically manuscripts, texts written upon the flesh or the yellow parchment of animals, divide us. The Journal of Mistress Joan Martin is a story centered upon medieval manuscripts and how one accesses them. The keepers of manuscripts in Wolf's story are not the stereotypical elite librarians with spectacles and university degrees. Rather, they are a farmer named John Martin and a strange traveler known only as Richard. The story opens with a comparison between manuscripts and people. Wolf's narrator, Rosamond, shares that she has won fame for her research into medieval land tenure. More significant than this, though, is the fact that she is a woman who has, quote, exchanged a husband and a family and a house in which she may grow old for certain fragments of yellow parchment which only a few people can read, and still fewer would care to read if they could." End quote. Throughout the course of her conversation with John Martin, Rosamond finds that he too has learned how to exchange people for manuscripts, how to feel the dead surround him simply because he holds their estate books. Here is where Wolf first refers to the pen that her diarist will later describe. Quote, he unrolled a long strip of parchment upon which an elaborate genealogical tree had been inscribed, with many faded flourishes and extravagances of some medieval pen. The bows spread so widely by degrees that they were lopped unmercifully by the limits of the sheet. End quote. Here the parchment does violence to the family, lopping off any of those who do not fit on the sheet. What brings the family back to life is the voice of the farmer. Here, Wolf suggests not only that the manuscript is insufficient for recording family history, but so too is the written record. Quote, no words of mine or attempts at a report of his words can give the curious impression which he produced as he spoke that all these relations were just, so to speak, brooding around the corner. End quote. She continues, now introducing light imagery that will become central to the short story. Quote, All generations seem bathed in his mind in the same clear and equable light. It was not precisely the light of the present day, but it certainly was not what we commonly call the light of the past. It was not romantic. It was very sober and very broad, and the figures stood out in it solid and capable, with a great resemblance, I suspect, to what they were in the flesh. This resemblance meant that Rosamond could almost hear the voices of the family, just as she could presently hear the laborers in the field below. Rosamond is suddenly convinced that no antiquary is needed here, as the family remains real, as Wolf writes, quote, all flesh and blood like I am, despite having been dead for centuries. And yet she asked to borrow the papers of John's grandmother Joan, papers which did not impress John upon reading them, as they offered nothing in the way of method, the way the account books of his forefathers did. Rosamond makes off with the papers, which she calls Grandmother Joan, and I have to admit my own affinity here as I have a grandmother Joan myself, 
Still alive in the flesh of the parchment, Joan is wrapped in brown paper and given to Rosamond, who walks away from Martin Hall. Just as Rosamond, the historian, finds her methods to be lacking, the journal of Joan Martin weaves a narrative that places the voices of the poor above the pens of the propertied. On the 18th page of Wolfe's manuscript, which is edited by Susan Squire and Louise de Salvo, but is not yet digitized by the New York Public Library and has not yet been seen by me, the narrative shifts to the voice of Joan, whose narration begins with a description of her mother's embroidering in the light of day. This act, which cannot be done in darkness, is similar to the reading and writing of the text, and yet it is an act that ties the mother to her servant, Anne, who sits with the family by the fire in the evenings. It is Anne who mends the family's clothes, who has a knowledge of history in many ways more valuable than that of Joan the diarist. Quote, she will tell you the history of each chair and each table or piece of tapestry in the house. Joan's curiosity about the household things stands in contrast to what she calls her duty to read, as long as the light serves, having received the manuscript of John Lydgate's The Palace of Glass. She reads it to the family. Wolfe's paragraphs here read as a dialogue between those inter interested in text and those interested in the stories of the past, which are sung or held in objects. It is in Joan's domineering mother who it is Joan's domineering mother who issues the command, "Read on, Joan, while there is light." This statement comes directly after Anne has broken in to say that there are fine stories of the Northmen, too, which she has sung to her mister and to Joan. When the darkness finally hits, Joan reports, the stories turn to present concerns on the state of the country and to the battles and the bloody deeds all around them. The next scene featuring a manuscript continues this subtle debate between Joan and her mother, as one morning Joan is called from her book to talk with her mother. Quote, she had a sheet spread before her, covered with close writing. She bade me read it. Having consulted the family accounts and determined the state of the land, Joan's mother informs her that it is time she were married. In these first two scenes of reading, we can begin to see why Joan will soon conclude that, quote, flesh and pens divide us. Her mother's preference for Lydgate over the stories of the Northmen as sung by the servant is directly related to her mother's willingness to marry Joan off for the financial well-being of the family. Sheets of parchment, Wolf shows us, physically limit interactions between people. They can only be read in the light. Joan's reading of Lydgate's Helen, moreover, only reinforces the power of her mother, whom she likens to Helen. But the end of the journal introduces a new kind of manuscript, carried by one of the strange pilgrims and peddlers who have begun cropping up on the roads surrounding the Martin estate. Quote, one bright May morning we saw a figure of a man striding along the road, walking, and walking fast and waving his arms as though he conversed with the air. He had a great wallet at his back, and we saw that he held a stout book of parchment in one hand, at which he glanced occasionally, and all the while he shouted words in a kind of measure with his feet, and his voice rose up and down in menace or in plaint. This figure of a man, as Wolf Styrus describes him, ostensibly sells books, but this description makes clear that what he really offers is a performance of texts the rhythm of which he marks with his feet and his voice. For him, the book is a companion, not unlike the relatives of John Martin, with whom Rosamond speaks during the first half of Wolfe's story. The man, who says his name is Richard, explains that he has a book of stories of the Knights of the Round Table, written out by the hand of Master Anthony himself, and painted by the monks of Cambria. These selling points aside, he explains, in figurative terms, how the book is his greatest possession. Quote, it is meat and drink to me, for it has lifted me over many miles of weary road, and 
It is the best of all companions on the way, for it has always something new to sing one, and it will be silent when I wish to sleep. There never was such a book. End quote. Thus the seller of books reveals that he will not part with his goods. The climax of Wolf's story, which promises to be a dull antiquarian piece about a historian reading the diary of a 15th century woman, is not the private reading scene, but is rather the public reading of Master Richard, who tells the story of Tristram and Isolde while standing on a mound of grass. The journal takes care to mention that, that for this reading, the gates were open and all laborers on the estate were invited to listen. Richard's highly physical, melodic reading, clearly done from memory, transports both him and the listeners so that at the end, Joan says she, quote, had half a mind to stretch out a hand and tell him he was safe. After the reading and dinner with the Martin family, Richard places his wares out on the table, various pieces of jewelry and sheets of parchment. Over all of these, Joan wishes most to see Richard's book. He placed the precious volume in my hands and bade me look at its pictures. They were like little mirrors held up to those visions which I had seen passing in the air, but here they were caught and stayed forever. The book, Joan's entry continues, was as yellow and gnarled on outside as the missile of any pious priest, but inside the brilliant knights and ladies moved, undimmed, to the unceasing melody of beautiful words. It was a fairy world that he shut inside his coat. It is this world that Joan envisions in the next entry as she takes a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady at Walsingham. Here, walking becomes reading, and the manuscript she has just seen is now replayed as Joan has a vision of men and women and lame people and blind people, and some were in rags, and some had ridden on horseback. It is here where she reflects, I thought desperately for a moment that it was terrible that flesh and pen should divide us. They would have strange, merry stories to tell. The implications of Joan's reflection, curiously placed within a manuscript, within the manuscript of Wolfe's short story, is that the written text cannot compare with the stories told in the dark, by the fire. In the penultimate paragraph, Joan the diarist shares her desire to be like Dame Elsbeth Ask one day, who, quote, when she grew too old to knit or stitch and too stiff to leave her chair, sat with clasped hands by the fire all day long, and you had only to pull her sleeve and her eyes grew bright and she would tell you stories of fights and kings and great nobles and stories of poor people too, till the air seemed to move and murmur. She could sing ballads also, which she made as she sat there, and men and women, old and young, came long distances to hear her, for all that she could neither write nor read. In this story, manuscripts are kept by a farmer on one hand and on another by a passing stranger with mystical qualities, described by the narrator as a strange bird who has passed through. Wolfe writes this piece in 1906, nearly three decades before the Book of Marjorie Kemp will be discovered. It ends with a moment of intimacy with the dead. How can we kiss the dead without holding flesh in our hands? How does the mind get us closer? Wolfe is not suggesting here that manuscripts ought not matter to us, but what she has given us is an account of how manuscripts and people are connected, how some manuscripts have lopped off half of the family, how the voices of the poor traveler or illiterate knitting dame are those most capable of stirring us. In the narrative of Joan Martin, a three-hour walk leads to more thinking than a whole week lived indoors. The storytelling of Richard on the Mound, where all are invited, is what grasps her attention and leads her to think most clearly on her way to Walsingham. Wolfe's story helps us to see how the archive has always been dark when it comes to the experiences of the poor, unlearned, or female. <laughs>
Rosamond, the historian, is able to read Joan's papers precisely because the farmer John Martin dismisses them as queer. These unread pages lead to more and more spaces of the unread. The tales Joan envisions are not read by her, but are rather sung to her and later imagined by her. Here we have an opportunity to think about how the silent stillness of the library might begin to open its gates the way the mother at Martin Hall does the day that Richard sings. Richard, the elusive strange bird, is a figure with no clear equivalent. Who might he be? And why did Virginia Woolf write this piece about medieval manuscripts without mention of a single librarian, professor, or other customary figure associated with what we have tended to call the guardians and gatekeepers of history. In the few critical essays on Wolf's story, we find scholars such as Lena Kor Schroeder, Laura Lojo Rodriguez, and Catherine Smith placing the piece within the context of Wolf's lifelong interests in history, class, and gender. Maria Mitchell argues that the structure of the story requires the reader's active participation. Right along with Rosamond Meridu, the reader comes to know what Mitchell calls the historian's own limited pursuit of the past as a knowable object, end quote. We all know that Wolfe helps to expand the canon of English literature, but one thing this pr particular story, thus far largely unsung by critics apart from a few I name here, is how Wolfe's texts open up questions about history and its sources. Prolific as she was, she calls attention to material objects. Indeed, for her, words are objects themselves, and perhaps not to be valued over other objects. Mitchell notes that, quote, Wolf constructs a non-linear sense of history with permeable membranes, employing a sense of historical interconnectedness that allows the inclusion of more and different kinds of people, particularly women, end quote. A year after Mitchell, Mitchell's article appears in the Chaucer Review, Heidi Stalla writes, the task for Virginia Stephen when she set out to write this story was, how could she use things, such as boots or stocking, stockings or a diary, to show aspects of the interior life, end quote. For Stalla, as with Mitchell, Wolf's story is an invitation for the reader to develop something like the archaeological eye of Rosamond Meridu. What would it mean to have such an eye? As we work from home this year, we have the opportunity to compare the status of what, what Wolf's diarist calls household things to the texts upon which our scholarship relies. Although our, although our own pilgrimages to histor historical sites may also be postpa postponed this year, we might imagine what it would mean to look and listen the way Wolf's characters do. If we can imagine the dead are still with us the way they have, do we still need to read the manuscript? How can we create such experiences with medieval works of literature that allow us to feel that the manuscript is a mirror for what we have already imagined, kept not only in the parchment, but also in the mind? How can we invest our resources in the kitchens of history the way Eileen Power proposes at the opening of her book, Medieval People? A Wolfian approach to the archive asks us to notice the relationship between manuscripts and the objects to which they refer, or indeed the objects that preserve them. The holy dolls carried by women in the Middle Ages, for instance, were backed with manuscript material, as Henrik Hellanemann has shown in her work on the nuns of Weinhausen. And here I do actually have an image of the work that conservators are doing to look literally under the dresses of the holy dolls to find the way that the manuscripts have backed this material object. The Jesus doll, to which the book of Marjorie Kemp refers in chapter 30, provides us with a medieval example of the objects Wolfe prefers in the journal of Mistress Joan Martin. The doll, an object placed in a cradle and wheeled through the church, or in a chest on the back of the donkey, moves across time and space. It helps to transport the devotee who takes it in her, into her lap. It forces us, moreover, to rethink 
what the space of the archive is and what kinds of experiences it can afford. If walking is reading and books can be kept under the garments of the devotional doll or the singing traveler called Master Richard, how much do we miss as we sit in silence at our appointed desks? Thank you.